All right. Hey, good morning, church family. Good to see you all. Glad you chose to worship with us this morning on this uh, first Sunday in August. Let's, uh, let's join together and warm up for our worship time and declare that there is one God and one King over everything. Join together as we sing. Lift up your gaze, be lifted up. Tell everyone how great the love, the love came down from heaven to kiss the earth with hope and grace. Mm, say, who is this King of glory, the Lord, the strong? One. 
Hallelujah. All right, take a few minutes to say hello to a few folks, especially the visitors. Hello, Harry. How are you? I have the movie if you want to watch it. Okay, what's wrong with the movie? Okay, where is it at? Is it this language? Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you out in the house of God this morning. I just want to remind you, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock is our prayer, praise, and seek time. Uh, if you can't be here on Sunday nights, uh, please remember that uh, the church is open Sunday mornings from 7 to 8.30 as well. Uh, don't forget, Tuesdays are our prayer and fasting time for our nation and the coronavirus. Uh, I was talking to my brother-in-law this weekend, and emotions are at an all-time high across the nation. Police are busier now than ever, going through a lot of personal persecution as well. So keep everyone in your prayers, your neighbors, your family, as we're still going through this trying time. Uh, Wednesday night, we're going to start a new series called Thriving in Babylon. And we're going to see a quick uh, clip of that here in a little bit. Uh, don't forget that you can give your tithes and offerings multiple ways. They're in your bulletin, as well as... Access to our sermons are online with Facebook, YouTube, and the website. Uh, for all other announcements, make sure that you check your website, the bulletin, and the calendar. And if our computer is cooperating today, we're going to show you the trailer real quick when driving in Babylon. In turmoil, we're dealing with a lot of stuff. Racism, poverty-stricken areas. Broken families. Sex trafficking. It's so violent now. Perversion. It takes everything out of God's divine order. I became very depressed. And I was going to take my life. And I said, God, I'll give you one more chance. And I said, God, please show me that you care. He went to back up a fellow officer and a group of gang members fired upon them and down this pit. And he died there. I didn't understand what about all those verses where it says he will lift you up. So I was yelling out to God. As an educator, my heart is for my students. There are rules or even constraints on when I'm able to share. It's difficult to weigh the balance of what, what's appropriate. I kind of made fun of Christians. I thought they were shallow. I thought uh, religion was a crutch that people use to get through life. Life is pretty fragile. That in itself made me want to live more for Christ because I don't know how much I've got. I don't want to waste a day. I got to a place in my faith that I had to be obedient to the Lord and I was taking a huge risk that people condemning me in my business. These are incredibly confusing times. It's as if we went to sleep and woke up in a completely different world. It leaves us, many of us, feeling confused, uh, uh, disoriented. We, we, we don't quite know how to respond to this place we find ourselves in. And yet, comes to the rescue a guy named Daniel and a book called Daniel. It was written to give instructions to adults 
who are living in a Babylon-like culture so we would know how to have an impact and how to have an influence. What was his secret? God is always in control of who's in control. He's never confused, he's never frustrated, he's never surprised, and therein lies the foundational cornerstone of Daniel's attitude, Daniel's action, Daniel's survival, and Daniel's thriving in Babylon. Good morning, church. I just wanted to give an announcement. Um, we've been uh, gearing up to go on a youth trip, which we are going next week. So today's the deadline to have your papers in. And any youth that is going, I urge you to be here this evening because you're going to find out, one, where you're going. And we have a little project we're going to be doing that with you um, to take along with you on the, on the trip. So I have that. And then just real quick, can every child and youth stand up in here real quick just quickly stand up all right so um in first timothy 4 12 it says let no one despise you for your youth but set the believers an example in speech in conduct in love in faith in purity so 144 12 says may our sons in their youth be like plants full grown our daughters, like corner pillars, cut for the structure of a palace. Numbers says, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Every single one of you are going to be setting an example for us in this church, for the world. And I'm believing that, that... You've been made for such a time as this, and I'm just believing that. Can everybody just take a look around at all these beautiful youth and children? So, do not look, let anybody look down upon you, because the Lord has a plan for you, and he is going to use you. Praise God. I can say amen to that. Good morning. Welcome, church, to the house of the Lord. Isn't it great to be here? Awesome. Glad you're here. I want you just to be reminded again of the trailer we just showed you concerning our Wednesday night study. This is going to be a fantastic study. Uh, it says a five-week series. We're going to take longer. We'll, and part of it's video. The other part's going to be open discussion. We're going to have a lot of discussion time. It'll probably go into the following weeks because we won't have time to talk about it. This is an extremely, extremely important study to come to. Please read your insert. Let me just read a few uh, bars of this insert here. These are confusing times for many Christians. Traditional biblical values are not only rejected, it seems as if they're attacking on every front. And it's all happened in warp speed. You can say amen to that. Warp speed. And I want you to notice on the bottom here, each session is going to include a real life story. They're going to be actually sharing real testimonies of what God's done in their lives through their difficulties and through their circumstances. We're going to learn a lot about Daniel. It's going to be a great time. So thank you for gearing up for that. Be prayed up for it and be here on Wednesday night. Praise God. We're going to take your offering this morning. Gentlemen, if you would please come forward. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. I know that uh, we have been down in attendance with the coronavirus, and there have been a lot of, of ups and downs and through the weeks, and not everybody's able to get here. But I tell you what, you have been so faithful with your giving. It is amazing. God is going to bless you, and he's blessing our church as a result of it. And we are thankful to God for you and your faithfulness and above all for his faithfulness. So keep up the good work. God bless you. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being here today. Thank you for the honor that is ours to worship and to bless your name. And today we begin our worship today by receiving this offering. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have placed into our lives each and every moment of every day, we are guided, guarded by your guardian angels 
Thank you, Lord, for encamping around us and protecting us and for the provisions you've made for each one of us. Lord, we give back a portion of what you blessed us with. And may you bless your church and your people as we give today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please stand for worship. Let's you honor the Lord with your tithe. Let's join together and offer him our best in worship. And also be ready to lay down our burdens here this morning. Join together as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside, lay aside your garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? Are you washed? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless, sunny, white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? How wonder so aimless a life filled with sin? I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light, but just like a blind man, I wondered alone, worries and fears I claim for my own, but just like the blind man, I got me back his side. I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, Just a few more 
Thank you, Lord. Stop. 
Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. Never stop. Is he your way maker this morning? Amen. Thank you, uh, Spirit, for being with us this morning. Thank you, worship team. Awesome job. Amen. Sometimes our worship team doesn't get enough credit, but they're an awesome bunch of people. Amen. Yesterday, a paper fell out of my Bible. I thought, wow, I better read this again because I read it a couple years ago here. So if you have your Bible, could you just hold it? Just hold your Bible. And think about what it actually means to you. We know it's the Word of God, but what does that mean? And I know I read this a couple years ago, but I must have to read it again to fell out my Bible. The Bible is the most remarkable book ever made. It is a library of 66 books, some of considerable size and some no longer than a track. These books include forms of literature, history, biography, poetry, hymns, letters, direction for worship, laws, parables, riddles, prophecy, and drama. The Bible is not a piece of jewelry or a charm or a book that will work wonders just by its presence. It is a book that will work wonders in every life here and hereafter if acted upon and obeyed in faith and sincerity. It is God's inspired revelation of the origin and destiny of all things and is written in the most simple human language possible so that we can understand and obey its, its teachings. It is self-interpreting and covers every subject of human knowledge and need now and forever. It is a book that reveals the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts binding, its history is true, and its decisions unchanging. The Bible is a mine of wealth, the source of health, a world of pleasure. It is given to us in this life, 
will be opened at the judgment and will stand forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the least to the greatest of labor, and will condemn all who treat it without seriousness or respect with its sacred contents. The Bible contains light to direct us, food to support us, and comfort to cheer us. It is our map, our staff, our compass, and our sword. Here heaven is open and the gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is its grand subject. Our good is its design and the glory of God its end. It should fill our memories, roll our hearts, and guide our feet in righteousness and true holiness. We need to read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully, meditatively, searchingly, devotionally, and study it constantly and perseveringly. We need to read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. We need to read it through and through until it becomes a part of our being and generates faith that will move mountains. One of God's gifts to us is word, the Bible. The answers we need, people, in today's world aren't out there, they're in here. Don't take the word for granted. Can we stand and pray? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the day. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here today in your house, dear Lord. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all things, Lord, and all, all that you've done, and Lord, most of all, all that you're going to do for each and every one of us. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that, that not only do we read it, Lord, but we study it, keep it close to our hearts, Lord. And Lord, that we don't only just be hearers, but doers of your word, dear Lord, so that each one of us can be blessed. Blessed, Lord, beyond our imagination. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you touch the one that's hurting today, dear Lord. And as they cry out to you, as they're hurting or sick or emotionally exhausted, dear Lord, may they faithfully, Lord, trust you. Trust you, Lord, that you're going to help them and give them their answer, Lord. Yes. And Lord, we, Lord, we pray that you wrap your loving arms around them, Lord. Thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, thank you for Pastor John this morning, Lord. Lord, the word he's going to give us today, Lord. Lord, what a blessing it is to have a pastor love you as much as Pastor John loves you, Lord. Lord, what a blessing him and Bonnie are to us, Lord. May you continue to bless them richly. And Lord, most importantly, thank you. Thank you for dying on that cross. Lord, that each one of us, each one of us may know you. You have given your all and rose again on that third day. Lord, you live today. Lord, and you live forever. And Lord, may today be the day that someone, someone comes to you. And Lord, may the Holy Spirit keep tugging at their heart, Lord, till they break, till they break into your kingdom, dear Lord. And Lord, we ask all this in your precious holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you. Praise God. We are in his house to learn about his word. God's word is the most important thing in life. Amen. 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 We're going to let the kids go, guys. Have a great time. God bless you. While they're leaving, I want to give you an announcement that is extremely important. How many of you remember a couple years ago we had Frank and Frank? Frank Menhard, right, and Frank Shelton were having them come back. Frank Shelton is called me this week, and uh, no pressure, but I felt led of the Lord. I'm going to call him this afternoon, and I'm going to invite him. He's coming this month. This month. Praise God. This is from Capital 
Hill, and I'm going to tell you something. He's going to give you some stories. You would not believe what he shared with me. I mean, I'm not going to divulge it. It is powerful. So I want Frank to come. I really want Frank to come. So Frank Shelton's going to be here this month. I don't know the exact date, probably near the end of the month. And then Frank Menhart's coming back on November the 15th. I was praying a couple weeks ago, felt led of the Lord to call him and to have him come in November. So we need to be praying. November's in a strategic month. Amen. Strategic month. And um, and this month is strategic as well. But be ready, be prepared to hear something from the Lord. Some really fantastic stuff that God's doing. All right? Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Jeremiah 37 and 38. I'm not going to read this passage to you because I'm going to tell you the story of Jeremiah, the brief part of the story of Jeremiah in these passages. These are the verses that I'm going to be talking to you about, just giving you the story. Um, what I'm doing is breaking this message up and telling you the story of Jeremiah, a brief part of his life, and then applying that to our own personal lives and understanding perseverance in our obedience. We are on a series on perseverance. I'm still not sure how long I'm going to be on this, um, but I, I really encourage you, if you haven't been here or were not able to, to listen to the other messages, listen to them because there's a lot of different approaches we're trying to take to understanding perseverance and how important it is as a Christian, as a believer, to persevere in the Lord. And in such times as we live in, we need to know how to persevere. Amen. Somebody say, thank you. My wife said amen. Good. I can hardly hear her most of the time, but that's great. Praise the Lord, right? We need to learn how to persevere. And so let's ask God to help us and lead us through this message today that God would give us uh, an understanding of his word. Father, always, always a special delight to study your word and to know it. And Lord, even more than that, the knowing the word is that we live out, we practice the truths of this word. Lord, I pray that you would just anoint your servant today. Lord, thank you for the anointing you gave me in studying. Thank you, Lord, for just anointing our hearts as we listen, as we hear today what your Holy Spirit wants to proclaim. Lord, may this be an encouraging word. May it be a word that drives us closer to yourself. Jesus, be magnified above all else today. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. Yes, and always the honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Well, how many of you have ever heard of Walter Payton? Most of you, right? Walter Payton was a 13 years. He was a running back for the Chicago Bears. Um, and uh, during his career, he rushed 16,726 yards. Now, that's more than nine miles, okay, in 13 years. What makes that figure even more spectacular is that he achieved it with the, being knocked down every 4.6 yards. He got knocked down. Well, if you know football, you have to tackle the guy with the ball, right? And so isn't it just like our lives sometimes where we feel like we're just getting started just getting a clear path to victory, and something comes along, and guess what? It knocks us off our feet. It knocks us down. And we're trying to be obedient. We're just trying to do what God has simply asked us to do. That God just wants us to be a part of his life, and we're being su submissive and obedient. But fact is, sometimes we're on that Fast track, we got a wide open space to go to, and bang, sure enough, somebody blindsides us and tackles us. In order for us to get our determination and our destination and our goal, we often have to persevere through those times when we do get knocked down and when we do 
have people uh, pursuing us. And when we get stopped by people, we get stopped by events that happen in our life. At times, God may bring something into your path that he wants to teach you and train you into something that you're going to need when you do reach your goal, when you do reach your destination. God wants you to learn something along the way. And there are other times when Satan himself, who is the enemy, is trying everything he can to keep you from getting to that goal, from getting to that end zone, to getting to that purpose that God's called you to. Either way, as a Christian, we're to do everything we can to be obedient to God. And even in our obedience, we have to learn perseverance, even in our obedience. Over the years, I have said many, many times, and you've heard me say this from this pulpit, that um, most people, those who are the most obedient, are the most faithful to God, often are the ones that go through the greatest trials, the greatest temptations, the greatest difficulties, the greatest testings. Great things happen to great people. And what makes so many people great is because they have learned how to withstand the great difficulties that are in their lives. That's why we have the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Those who persevered and got through, and God uses them as a great example. But God has a plan for every single person, but many people struggle with finding that plan, finding that purpose, because they're lacking in understanding how they need to be obedient to God in every area of their life. Not just in one area, but in every area of our life, being obedient to Him. So in order for us to get a grip on how we can persevere in our obedience to the Lord, I want to examine a little portion of prophet Jeremiah's life. And we see a man who here who's learned to persevere in his obedience. This is just a little glimpse of his life, just a snapshot of his life. And I would like us then to examine what it means for us to persevere in our obedience. And there are four things I think we need to do in persevering uh, in our obedience. Now, I know you've come here this morning because you're obedient to the Lord. You want to be in God's house. You want to be with God's people. And I know that people love Jesus and they love the Lord. And some of you couldn't be here today and you're watching this. That's awesome. That's great. You're part of the body of Christ. And we're eternally grateful that you've joined us today. But I'm asking you to take this to heart and be challenged to continually be obedient in the Lord, even as Jeremiah was. So let's look at Jeremiah a man who persevered in obedience. Jeremiah kept getting knocked down. He had faithfully proclaimed God's message of destruction to Judah for 40 years. Judah was the southern kingdom. Israel was the northern kingdom. And now all of his warnings and predictions were coming true. Here is Babylon had laid siege to Jerusalem. They were in captivity in Babylon, as you know, for 70 years. And the fall of the city was imminent. And you would think after proclaiming a message that's being fulfilled before their very eyes, that people would start believing Jeremiah. But Jeremiah's message only hardened the hearts of people. They kept taking shots at him. They kept knocking him down, beating at him, leaving him for dead. But Jeremiah kept, kept getting back up. Here's a man who was called the weeping prophet kept getting knocked down, kept getting back up. People would not listen to him. He did not have a single convert in his whole entire ministry. Jeremiah persevered in obedience. What was it that happened to Jeremiah? Well, first of all, Jeremiah was arrested for deserting to the enemy. Now, he actually did not desert to the enemy, but here's what they're accusing him of. First, we find Jeremiah leaving Jerusalem during a withdrawal, the withdrawal of Babylonian forces. And so he was going to the land of the Benjamin to claim his portion there among the people in Jeremiah 37, where he talks about 
that the meaning of that statement is really kind of uncertain. However, it relates to the field that he purchased in chapter 32. So he's going back to the land that he purchased that he was going to be his. But nevertheless, while he's leaving, a guard saw him leaving and arrested him and charged him as a traitor, defecting to the enemy. And that accusation angered Jeremiah. He had been loyal to his country. He had stood strong. He had voiced truth. He longed for the countrymen to turn back to God. They refused, referring, refer, referring themselves more and desiring more of the darkness rather than the light. So they brought him to the city officials where they beat him and imprisoned him. He stayed there for several days. The Bible tells us that King Zedekiah sent for him to see if God had a word for Israel. So even King Zedekiah understood that Jeremiah heard from the Lord. And Jeremiah confronted this weak, vacillating kind of king. He vacillated all the time. He was very weak. And he's saying, you, you will be handed over to the king of Babylon. That's in chapter 37. Now, considering his circumstances, it would have been easy for Jeremiah to give in, to give up, and just stay down. And Jeremiah would not. He got back up. He boldly proclaimed the truth. In spite of what the truth was saying, people needed to hear it and obey it, and they refused. Now, here's the second thing you see in this story of Jeremiah is that he was accused of um, demoralizing, demoralizing the army. Now, obviously, Jeremiah did not do this, but Jeremiah proclaimed a lot of messages that talked about defeat, destruction, devastation. But however, as I said several weeks ago, that when God gives a prophetic word, there is power in that word, and sometimes that means destruction. That means that there could be something that could happen that's devastating. But God always gives us a promise. If we listen to him, if we obey him, God will deliver us. Amen. Amen. So nothing, not really, but those words are not something that you would speak at a, as a, as a pep talk before a big game. The coach would never say those words. You're going to get defeated, you're going to have destruction, and you're going to be devastated. It's not really the kind of word that you would hear. But his words dis discouraged the soldiers who were left to defend the city. See, they heard what they wanted to hear. The officials wanted the king to kill Jeremiah. And the king, the weak and cowardly king, refused to do anything to Jeremiah or the officials making the charge. Because in Jeremiah 38, verse 6, he says, So they, which is quoting the officials, took Jeremiah, dropped him into cistern of Malachi. That's not Malachi. It's, it's Mal, Malsha. Malsha, whatever. I'm terrible with words. Forget it. There was no water. No water in that cistern, only mud. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. Now, Jeremiah's message obviously was not popular, and neither was he. The people wanted a sermon of mercy and not of justice. They wanted a God who would wink at their sins, not a God who would punish for sin. Not a God who needed to discipline. Jeremiah spoke the truth in spite of what they wanted to hear. And so you see, the truth is painful. To deliver a painful message as Jeremiah did, you could see why the average person would not want to hear it. It causes people to want to punch on you, right? They want to pounce on the truth. And it, it angered the officials so that they wanted Jeremiah to literally be put to death. But the king refused to kill Jeremiah. So the officials did the next best thing. 
they lowered Jeremiah into this empty cistern. And another, another imprisonment, another knockdown. Cisterns were dug out of rocks. These were cisterns that were dug for the, for, because during the dry time when the, they, they needed water, and during the rain time, it would go into these cisterns that were big, made out of rocks, really deep, and would be like a pear shape at the bottom, and would hold a lot of water. And so Nehemiah gets put in there where it's really, really muddy, and he began to sink this filthy, dirty, awful pit. Here was Jeremiah sinking in the mud, a slow, filthy death, but God delivered him. For someone who had been faithful, somebody who had been obedient, for somebody who declared the absolute truth. Look at what happened to Jeremiah. And then here's the third thing we see in those passages of scripture. is that Jeremiah was asked to deliver the message to the king. See, after Jeremiah's rescue from the cistern, the king sent for him. Now the king wanted to hear from the prophet again for a reason. But you see, he asked Jeremiah to be honest. He said, Jeremiah, I don't want you holding back and withholding any information. He was hoping against all hope that Jeremiah's prophecy would be more favorable than the prophecies that were given earlier. That somehow Jerusalem would be spared. But here's where Jeremiah replied. If I tell you, you will kill me, won't you? And besides, if I give you advice, you won't listen to me anyway. I mean, nothing like counter like it is. You're not going to listen to me, so why should I be telling you this? That's found in Jeremiah 38, verse 15. See, the king promised his protection. And Jeremiah told the king that if he surrendered to the Babylonian king, he, the city, and his family would be spared. But if he did not surrender, the city will be burned down and they will all perish. Jeremiah hid nothing from the king. He ran his race with integrity. He carried the ball without fumbling. And look at what he got in return. Beatings, imprisonments, polluted system, death threats. He got knocked down again and again and again. And I'm here to tell you this morning, sometimes the truth hurts. The truth is painful. The truth sometimes is difficult. In our world, when we tell the truth, people do not want to hear it. Amen. Are you with me? Jeremiah's story is a little bit like Jesus' story, isn't it? Where he too was a prophet. And he once said, as sure as you know that there is no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 4 tells us that. And though popular as first he saw the tide of popularity and opinion begin to shift. The closer he got to the cross, the more he spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, the more he spoke out truth, the more difficult it was for people to hear with him and be their true disciple. He was misunderstood. He was called names. He was knocked down again and again. And he walked by the way of the cross through. He did not desire the cross, but he had to take the cross as the Father willed him to take the cross. His obedience was put to the ultimate test. He too ran for glory and he won. Somebody say amen. 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 Jeremiah ran for glory and he won. He won. Jesus ran for glory. Hallelujah. He won. Yes, amen. He won. He won. So what does it mean to persevere in obedience for us? Here's a man like Jeremiah, just as we talked about last week, Joseph, who none of us would probably go through what Joseph's gone through. And we talked about on Wednesday night, Job himself. Is there, is there anyone here that would go through what Job went through? 
I mean, we can't even compare ourselves and what we go through. And yet, in Jesus himself, these are people who persevere through stuff that we'll never, ever experience in our life. So how do we persevere like that? Well, first of all, to persevere in obedience means that we stand by our convictions. I need somebody to say amen to that one. Amen. Amen. Stand by your convictions. Throughout Jeremiah's ordeal, he stood by his conviction, speaking the truth of God's will, even if it was unpopular. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, an iron pillar and a bronze wall. That was what he was compared to. He was a man of, of unfaltering conviction. Jesus, likewise, would not be distracted from his mission. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. It does not matter what other people were saying or doing. He came to seek that which was lost, and that was mankind. So here's a person with conviction, knows what he believes, where he is going, and why. Convictions are not forced on in any individual. They are beliefs and they are actions of choice. They are the truth. They are the mission, the calling given by God that is not altered by time. It's not altered by people. It's not altered by opinions or by circumstances. When you stick to your convictions, in spite of what other people say, are saying to you, stick to your convictions. Amen. What you believe. Francis Kelly wrote, Convictions are the mainsprings of action, the driving powers of life. What a man lives are his convictions. Convictions. Martin Luther King Jr. often told his children this. He said, if a man is nothing that is worth dying for, he is not fit to live. Ooh. Yeah. If a man has nothing that is worth dying for, he is not fit to live. Christ in my life is worth dying for. Amen. I would give my life for the cause of Christ. How about you? <laughs> Chariots of Fire. Some of you probably have seen that movie many, many years ago. It's based on a true story, inspiring story of Eddie Lindell. Uh, Lindell, I believe that's how you pronounce it. And during the 1924 Olympics, he planned to compete in those Olympics. But if there was an event that was on a Sunday morning, and he had a personal conviction about, about running on Sunday. That was his personal conviction. And he had every right to stand up for that. That's personal in his life. And he had trained for this event, but his Olympic hopes crumbled because he wasn't allowed to run that event. He held to those convictions, not competing with that race, but he entered a different event, an event that he did not train for, an event he probably should not have won at all. But as he's preparing as much as he could for it, he starts that event, and just before the race started, something was handed to him on a piece of paper that said this, he who honors me, I will honor. Yes. Eric ran that race in faith, and his convictions were unbroken, and he honored God, and God blessed him, and he won a gold medal. Praise God. Amen. God will bless you and honor your convictions. They're your convictions. Stick with them. Don't bend them for other people. Amen. Hello. Every day will challenge our convictions. The person who perseveres in obedience lives by those convictions. Not once in a while, not when it's convenient, but every single day. Yes. Every single day. Number two, to persevere in obedience means to make the right choices. People who persevere choose not to stay down. They get up. The choices that we made yesterday affect the choices we're making today. The decisions that you make today will determine our tomorrow. Jean Paul Sartre wrote these words. We are our choices. We are 
our choices. Amen. Obedience is always a choice. Amen. No one forces you to obey God. Nobody forces you to obey his word or his will. It boils down to a choice that you and I make every single day. A choice to be faithful or not. A choice to be loving or not. A choice to be available or not. A choice to be willing or not. It's my decision. God doesn't coerce me. God asked me. God is saying, it's up to you. I do have a free will. God gave you and me a free will to say yes or no. We choose. Amen. We choose to be obedient and we choose to make the right choices. The choices that determine our obedience are the ones regarding honesty and integrity and sincerity. The husband who remains faithful and loyal to his wife. The athlete who refuses to take stimulus or drugs to enhance their bodies or performance. The student who, who cracks the books rather than opting to go the easy road. Or paying someone to write a term paper for you. You know how much that goes on, especially in the college level. A choice. Doug Sherman and William Hendricks, in their book, How to Succeed, Where It Really Counts, tells of this little story that I think is extremely important for us to understand. They were two friends that owed or owned an extremely, extremely profitable business. They put it up for sale. They gave their word that pending a few details, they would sell that particular business to the people that they were talking to that, that day, that Friday afternoon, and they decided, okay, we're gonna shake on this. Yep, we're gonna sell you this property. We're gonna earn business, I'm sorry. So, the weekend comes. Guess what? They get a phone call from another group of people that want to buy the business and they want to offer way more than what was offered on Friday. And so they begin to pray about it. They pray with their wives and they agree together. By, the, by that Sunday, they came to a conclusion that when Monday rolls around, they're going to sell that property to the people that they said they were going to sell it to on Friday and not take the more money which they could have easily had and pocketed that money because they had integrity. Amen. Yeah. Integrity. They made their decision not based on dollars, but on obedience to right living. It's simple things like that which would make it easy for the enemy to try to attack us and to tell us, you know what, we can, we, you know, come on, a lot more money, we can pocket this money, we can invest this money, we can, you know, who would, who would not be tempted or tested? But integrity is so much more important. Number three, to persevere in obedience means that we maintain personal character. Jeremiah maintained his character by standing for the truth of God's word in the midst of people. He's preaching a completely different message. Now, aren't you hearing a different message in our world today? We are hearing many, many kinds of messages. In fact, we gotta be careful because we're hearing a lot of false prophets as well as some, I believe, some good prophets. But you know, there are a lot of voices. Listen, Christian, be careful with to who you listen to. Be careful of the voices. Be careful of the media that you're listening to. You're getting a lot of lies. We're getting a lot of deception. Be very careful. Be selective in what you're hearing. And pray about it before you start gullibling everything up. Be very careful. Jeremiah's character remained intact. The most pressing need in our world today is a Christ-like character. Amen. Come on. Amen? Amen. Unfortunately, this is trait is short and it's short supply. It's diminishing every day. Gail um, she in her book wrote in her book called Character. America's search for leadership writes this. The root of the word character is the Greek word for engraving. 
As applied to human beings, it refers to the enduring marks left by life that set one apart as an individual. In other words, what they're saying is that character is that encompassing ingredient in life that makes us different. It makes us different. Different. And finally, to persevere in obedience, we refuse to compromise. Compromise. I do believe that there are times when we do need to compromise. We need to compromise little things that have little insignificance. So we individually, when we talk to people to have peace, we compromise things. That's understandable. But I'm not talking about that kind of compromise. We never, ever compromise the truth. Amen. Jeremiah did not compromise with those who arrested him, charging him of desertion, nor with those officials who wanted Jeremiah to soften his message. He could have just softened the message and the people would have felt better. People would have maybe started listening to him. But it wasn't about peace and prosperity. It's about truth. If God gives a message, give the truth. Yes. Hello. Amen. Amen. Nor with King Zedekiah, who longed for Jer Jeremiah to agree with his hired prophets, who said that, Ju that Judah would prevail. I mean, he wanted everything to go his way. Now listen to me carefully, because Christian history is filled with inspiring, featuring people of, of principle, those who are in, immoralized, as far as I'm concerned, for refusing to compromise their beliefs. Man, we could stand up here all day and speak of historical figures and people in the Word of God that have have not compromised their word. But let me give you one example. In 1660, England experimented with republic type of government. And it was interrupted quickly by Marxism again, coming into play with, with Charles II. And with this change, religious freedom was also ended. They had to to obey what the England church was, the Anglo-Saxons, the, Ang the Anglicans. And again, again, designed as the official state religion. When I was over in England, I'll never forget, even in the, and I told Janet this, this week, that even when we were in an evangelical church over there, the churches don't pay their pastor, the state pays their pastors. Those pastors are at the mercy of the government, the federal government pays, and if they don't preach and teach what they want them to, guess what? They're compromising. If they, they're probably kicked out. They, they got to toe the line. So again, it became illegal to conduct church services outside the Church of England back in 1660. Unlicensed individuals were forbidden to address religious gatherings. But there was one man under this new law, John Bunyan, was arrested for preaching without a license and his growing popularity, though prompted the judge to seek some sort of compromise, he did everything he could, he wanted to compromise, guess what his compromise was? Yeah, promising Bunyan immediate release from prison if he promised never to preach again. And guess what his, his reply was? If you release me today, I'll be preaching tomorrow. <laughs> no compromise. Three times in his life, Bunyan was arrested, convicted, and put in jail for preaching the gospel without a license. And in the end, he spent over 20, or 12, I should say, 12 years in prison. At any time during those years, he could have secured his freedom by simply promising not to preach. How many of uh, of us would cave in to that. But Bunyan knew God's calling on his life. And so, and so without, without a question, he refused to compromise his convictions. 
Those prison years were certainly not wasted. It was during that time when Bunyan wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress. Immediate success. That book has been read next to the Bible. That book has been read more than any other book in history. Next to the Bible. It is a powerful allegory. Powerful. If you've never read it, read it. It's a classic. And in countries such as Burma and China, North Korea, Pakistan, Vietnam, Christian pastors and evangelists and other believers are in prison today because they will not compromise their Christian witness. And today in the 21st century, Iran and the church is increasing under intensified persecution. You know that the church in Iran is growing leaps and bounds because of the persecution? People will not compromise the word of God. It's like in the early book of Acts that expanded an explosion took place after the day of Pentecost. Why? Because people refused. They refused to give in to, to man's, man's begging and man's desire in what they wanted to do. This, there was an explosive growth even in spite of the great persecution. And when it comes to issues of faith, we are expected to stand for Christ and his kingdom and his principles. And today in America, we're under attack for our faith. Christianity has been marginalized by antichrist media and liberal government. And that is time for Christians. We need to stand up and declare what is right. Amen. The word of God is our sword. The word of God, we fight with it. Somebody say amen. amen. Are you in agreement with me this morning? Amen. This is the most important weapon and tool that we have to use in the body of Christ and for this lost world. Today in America, we need to stand up and we have to fight for our rights if we're going to defeat the enemy. I want to show you this video in closing. Pastor Jeffries, he is talking, I believe, was, was this on Sean Hannity? Did I, I forgot what I picked this out and I forgot it. I'm sorry. Just listen to it, will you please? The panel on The View mocking Vice President Mike Pence for saying that he talks to Jesus. Watch. I think when you have a Mike Pence that now sort of puts this religious veneer on things and calls people values voters, I think we're in a dangerous situation. I'm a faithful person, but I don't know that I want my vice president um, well, well, speaking in tongues. Like I said before, I don't know if I want it's that. It's one thing to talk to Jesus. It's another thing when Jesus talks to you. Mental illness, if I'm not correct. I don't I'm like hearing it. voices. Pastor Robert Jeffress is a senior pastor at First Baptist Church and a faith advisor to President Trump. Pastor Jeffress, thanks for coming on this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you're having a reaction just hearing that again. What is it? Well, look, let's just go ahead and say what we all know is true. If George Behar had attacked a devout Muslim for his faith, ABC would have fired her in a nanosecond. But you know, to the left, when it comes to attacking conservative Christians, it is always open season. And you know, I've often asked, why is it that evangelicals supported a secular candidate like Donald Trump by the largest margin in history? This is the reason. Christians are tired of being bullied for their faith in the public square. They wanted an administration who would respect rather than ridicule their beliefs. And in many ways, the election of Donald Trump and Mike Pence was a reaction against these kind of despicable attacks upon people's faith. Why do you think that they have such a problem with the vice president and his beliefs? Well, scratch beneath the surface, or read what they've said in the past, and it's very clear. Mike Pence has committed the unpardonable sin when it comes to the left, and that is he still maintains the personal belief that marriage should be between a man and a woman. And look, 
Everybody doesn't agree with that perspective. He understands that. But you can hardly call that an extreme perspective when it's the belief of the three major world religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, which have taught that for years, thousands of years. And look, this once again shows the hypocrisy of the left. The left cries for tolerance, tolerance, and yet they are the most intolerant people when it comes to beliefs with which they disagree. You also have a prediction to make about the next presidential election if the left continues to keep up their ridicule of conservative Christian beliefs. Look, I, I told President Trump last week, he has become the most faith-friendly president in history. And his selection of Vice President Pence is just one example of that. But if Joy Behar and her ilk continue these kind of unfounded attacks, you're going to see President Trump re-elected by a landslide in 2020, and you're going to see Vice President Pence become President Pence in 2024. Got, that is my prediction. I've got to leave it there, Pastor, but final word to you on Mike Pence and his response to this. We have not yet seen or heard a response from him. Do you think you should respond? Uh, my guess is you will hear a very gracious response in some form very soon. Mm. Pastor. Now you know what you know from that clip that this was a couple of years ago. This isn't even just recently. It increases more and more as time goes on. And we are being duped and we are being told all kinds of things and we are being people Christianity is it's they're trying to literally, literally destroy Christianity in America. If you don't think that's happening, you need to listen very carefully. It is happening. It is happening. And they're doing everything they can. And we need to be men and women of obedience to God and persevere in our obedience to the Lord. And let me tell you something. In the end, after you've been knocked down and repeatedly, what will you do? After you've run the race, what will you leave in your legacy? And in Jeremiah's case, I want you to think of all of the millions of people who've been blessed by reading and studying his word. That word that's put in, the, in, in God's word. I want you to think of those who've been saved, who've been spared the trouble because they were obedient to the word of God. What will this generation, what will the next generation learn from our life of obedience? Will they be able to persevere in times of difficulty? Will they have the strength to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ as we do? If you want to persevere in this life, and if you and I want to enjoy life to come, then we have to be determined to do these four things. Stand up for your convictions. Make the right choices. Maintain personal character and refuse to compromise your Christian beliefs. Somebody say amen. 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 Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for prophets like Jeremiah who set such a wonderful example for us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to take this truth, to take this simple truth and remind ourselves, Lord, that this is all we need to do is just simply be obedient to you and you will take care of the rest. That we have nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to worry about, because Lord, you are not the you are not the the author of fear or confusion. Lord, you said it very clear in your word. You have given us the the power, not of fear, but of love, and of a sound mind. Lord, we stand on that word today, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand, please? Praise God. I challenge you this week, on Tuesday, please be praying and fasting for our nation. On Tuesdays, please do that. If anybody here is interested in doing a Zoom meeting of prayer, would you please sign up at the table in the foyer? Please sign up if you'd like to join a team. There's no one that has signed up as of yet. And if you would like to participate in that, we promise it's not going to be a long, drawn-out prayer meeting type thing, but just where you can pray together and be in agreement for our nation. And listen, the one way we can persevere, Christians, the one way we can persevere is prayer.
Amen. the power of Amen. prayer and the word of God. God has given us the victory already. It is ours. We declare it in the name of Jesus and nobody's going to conquer God's church. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise God. We love you. Have a great day in the Lord. And we have prayer tonight at 6. God bless you. Good to see you.